Hi, everyone. Welcome to the live taping of JS Party. Woo! Woo. Thank you, thank you. Uh, how many people here have listened to JS Party before? At least one episode. Wow, a lot of people. Thank you so much for listening. That's awesome. So you know that we usually have some uh, intro music, so I can't break with tradition there. Just start that up. You don't normally see this, but we, we use Zoom and we dance in the videos to each other, but we don't release that, so. I, I don't know how to dance. <laughs> Right, awesome, that gets us in the mood. All right, thank you so much for coming to JS Party Live at Node.js Interactive. Now, another thing that we uh, end up doing on a lot of episodes is either some kind of rap or poem or, um, or haiku to kick off and get started. And so I have one of those prepared, uh, written by yours truly. But first, I got my slides mixed up, I want to, talk about JS Party a little bit for those of you who may not have heard of it. Uh, JS Party is a weekly uh, podcast about JavaScript and the web, and we talk uh, a lot about a lot of different things. And we have a great diverse cast list where not all of us are on the, every episode, so that keeps things fresh. Uh, but we have Suze Hinton, Faras Abuka DJ, Kevin Ball, Emma Wedekind, uh, Divya Sasidar, and Michael Rogers, uh, Christopher Hiller, who is at this conference, and if you're in this room, that means that you're not at his talk right now, <laughs> so um, thank you for supporting me. Uh, and then Jared Santo and myself, Nick Nisi, thank you so much. Uh, so back to that, um, that limerick that I have. <laughs> at Node.js Interactive, the talks are all quite attractive. From transpilation dread to awesome worker threads, this conf is surely impactive. Thank you. Right. <laughs> so yeah, uh, in this, we're gonna get started and we're just gonna talk to uh, some of the speakers that you've heard throughout uh, today and yesterday. And we're going to uh, talk about their talks and dig a little deeper, ask some other questions and uh, really get more out of them and more out of their content. And uh, yeah, so let's, let's just go ahead and kick it off. The first speaker, I got my, my slides mixed up again, sorry. Uh, I forgot that I have this in here. If, if you haven't listened to us before, um, these are some recent episodes that we have. Uh, right now, if you're here, you're also not listening to this live, but we are currently uh, live interviewing Ahmad Nasri, the CTO of NPM. That episode will be released next week. Uh, but other episodes that we've had include a discussion on ES modules, uh, modernizing Etsy's code base with React, mentorship uh, with Khalil Lachelle. Uh You're probably using streams with Matteo Kalina, who uh, also gave a talk at this conference. And then uh, we also have some fun episodes like, we should rebrand JavaScript, yep or nope. And that's a, a debate where you're assigned uh, your thoughts on that and then you have to defend those thoughts, whether we should rebrand JavaScript in this case. All right, so let's get started and let's interview our first guest. And that is Vladimir Deturkin. You wanna come on up? Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So you gave a talk yesterday, uh, and it was called, uh, it, it was on Node.js loader hooks. Yeah, that's right. Tell me about that. Um, so Node.js loader hook is an experimental API in Node.js. It's linked to his ES6 module, so it's the future and everyone loves that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Basically, it's an API that enables you to hook any module that is loaded, and then you can do whatever you want, from logging to actually creating virtual module and load them. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't hook existing modules that are loaded, it hooks modules that are asked to be loaded. So let's say you are loading a module that is not present in your node modules, you could dynamically create it virtually from a hook. Mm -hmm. It's just mad science. That is really cool, and it, this is actually something that I haven't hadn't heard about uh, until seeing your talk yesterday. Um, so, what? Why were uh, loader hooks created? What's the the problem that they're trying to solve? So th that's a great question. There's, there are a few reasons why you won't want to know which modules are loaded. Uh, I was not part of the working group who designed this API, so I can't give a definitive answer on why they created it. Sure. What I can say is that, um, so at screen, uh, I do uh, instrumentation of Node.js processes for security. 
meaning that I need to know which modules are loaded because I need to inject security algorithms in these modules as they are loaded. And that's a similar issue that APMs have as New Relic, Elastic, or, or Dynatrace. So all these vendors, uh, we need to know which modules are loaded because we need to know what we need to instrument. Mm -hmm. Usually, historically, we use a very ugly patch by monkey patching some private method in Node, which out of, out of uh, which technically is not private anymore because half of the ecosystem relies on that anymore now. But uh, I see TSC member looking at me with anger, so they created a proper API for us to do that without uh, breaking everything. Nice, very cool. So it's it's to uh, understand what's in the cache is is kind of the big. So it, it it's even before what's in the cache. It's when the module are loaded, mm -hmm. you have the chance, the opportunity to uh, intercept that and even rewrite the module. So I in the talk yesterday, I had three examples. One of them was actually rewriting type, uh, loading TypeScript modules. Mm -hmm. So if you create a loader hook that transpiles TypeScript to JavaScript, you could virtually tell Node, hey, this is how to do with TypeScript. And it would not run TypeScript natively because nobody does that. But it will run TypeScript transparently, meaning that you would not have any single file of JavaScript in your code except the module. And Node will know how to do TypeScript because you, you would have teach it how mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, after the talk, someone told me about having a YAML loader because there's a lot of things you can do in YAML that you can't do in JSON but that are still possible in JavaScript objects. Okay. So the idea would be like, hey, I want to import YAML modules transparently without having to read the file and transpire that. I want my developers to just import YAML's module, and that's pretty much what this API can do. Interesting. So do you see that as um, being something that developers use um, like in their actual production apps? Um, like for for that example, like could that be? I, I know that it's experimental now, but is the end goal to be uh, like a, a really stable API that you can use to to do things like that? So it will be used in production at least for APMs because uh, eventually it will be the only way to intercept loaded modules. So that's definitely a business need for APMs. Uh, regarding transformations. Uh, Yes, I mean, the TypeScript transformation, I would recommend having a build step. Mm -hmm. But if you want to load other things like YAML, this is a great example, I don't see any reason why you would not use that in production when it's stable. The only potential issue in the future is that how do you compose multiple loader hooks? Mm -hmm. And we know that the JavaScript ecosystem is really strong on having uh, entropy and diverse things in the ecosystem. So I, I hope there will be a soon a standard for people to play along and not to step in, in each other's feet when mm -hmm. loading modules. Very cool. So you can only load, use one loader at a time, is that, is that right? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, another example that you gave uh, in your talk yesterday was uh, mocking or, or stubbing modules uh, by changing them and, and you were using a proxy. Do you want to describe that a little bit for our listeners? Yeah, uh, it was a pretty complex use case. So the idea is that, uh, as I told, you can rewrite the modules dynamically as they are loaded. Mm -hmm. So in, in my example, which is a proof of concept, please don't use that, uh, even if it's on GitHub, so I guess it's public domain. Um, in this example, what I do is that when a module is loaded, I check everything that is exported because it's just an array of string with the name of the things that are exported. And I replace all of the exports by your proxy, which is a native object in, in JavaScript that enables you to trap everything that happens on an object. Uh, so I replace each of these exports by a proxy and I expose the proxy handler, the, uh, the definition of how the proxy behave to the end user, meaning that when you load the module that has been transformed, you also have access to a set of objects that enables you to change the behavior of all of the exports. So of course, to make it smarter, we need to bet recursivity on that to change deeper, deeper, uh, deeper fields, but uh, the first level thing is good enough. Basically, instead of changing your code to make it easier to test, you would just need to load your code, and then in your test file, you will be able to mock by changing the proxies and the behavior of the code, but only for your test file, not for the whole world. Yeah, that's really cool. So you would not necessarily have to write like code that injects the dependencies. Yeah. Uh, you could just 
have it through the loader inject uh, the the uh, hook or uh, sorry the um, the handler for the proxy and then change things on the fly and change them back afterwards. Exactly. Over the few last years, there have been so many people since so many people reinventing the wheel for dependency injection in mm -hmm. Node. Uh, I won't throw any annotation heavy framework on that, uh, but uh, that's the thing. Stop reinventing the wheel and creating one thousand of projects where we can have one single, or at least cleaner way of doing that that does not require your code to have uh, unstandard module loading. Because mm -hmm. that's the main issue I have with all of these alternative dependency injections thing, is that they reinvent the way you load modules, meaning that, A, I'm still a vendor, I still do Node.js instrumentation, and if you do weird things, that gives me more work to instrument it, mm -hmm. and I'm lazy. <laughs> the best developers are. Um, so the... Like, one thing that we rely on right now, like, I, I write TypeScript full-time, uh, and I use ES module Excellent like choice. syntax. Yeah. <laughs> I use ES module like syntax uh, in TypeScript, and then I rely on tools like, like Just, and I, I haven't looked at what Just is actually doing, but it has the ability to mock your dependencies like this, uh, which I assume is just relying on the, the fact that it's just an underlying common JS module that's actually being run and, and being able to do that. So do you see loader hooks as like the solution for those types of problems uh, in the future when theoretically we're all just writing straight ESM? Definitely. Uh, also in my understanding, loader hooks will also be available, available for common JS, oh, cool. uh, closing parentheses. But um, actually there will be no other solution to right. hook into things that are imported through ES6 modules. So people will have to go with that. And sometimes it's good to uh, have a unique way of doing that. But this API has been done cleanly. Historically, you can only mock modules synchronously. This API is based on async functions, meaning that you can do async treatment when you mock the modules. It will be incredibly powerful. And I think my talk is just an opening on a few possibilities you can do with that. Mm -hmm. but I'm really excited to see what people will build around that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that, that really opens up things like, uh, what was one example? You you were uh, fetching something, right? Yeah, it's um, I think it's the equivalent of Yarn plug and play or the Go yeah. module loading system where you don't have the package.json. Disclaimer, I love package.json. I just love to do weird stuff to, uh, on my free time. Um, so basically, you would be loading modules from a URL because it's just plain text at the end of the day or bytes. And if you have uh, a stream bytes that Node.js knows how to instrument it, whether it's JavaScript or WebAssembly, you just need to find a way to get it locally on your machine mm -hmm. and to give that to Node.js to build a module for. So yeah, one of my examples was like instantiating a GIST without downloading it before starting the process, letting Node download the GIST for me and uh, instantiate it. Uh, this cause this opens the door to a lot of and a thousand of uh, security concerns. That's why it was just one exam putting over, and I, I think if you want to go that way, we, you need to have a couple of people full time to uh, figure out the security impact of such things. Yeah, we don't need to worry about that. I'm yeah. sure it'll be fine. Security is not a big deal, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Someone just say no. <laughs> So that's really cool, and I see this API as being like one of those uh, APIs. I'm thinking back to Miles' uh, keynote uh, yesterday, where he was talking about, um, I think he called it the the existential dread of transpilation, or, or something along those lines, uh, where like, we'll, like we like we are using transpilation and we're using uh, like CommonJS and, and all of this, and like there are a lot of things that CommonJS can do uh, or can be abused to do that. ES modules really can't because of the way that they're statically analyzed and things like that. And this seems like one of those APIs that is uh, allowing us to have, uh, not really have to take away a lot of features when we go to that. So we can do things like that, kind of get in the middle of how modules are actually loaded and change that in really interesting ways. Uh, another way is like the, um, I think it was called module attributes, where you can, uh, you might be able to load JSON in the future with ES modules, for example. So, yeah, actually someone came to me after the talk and asked, hey, would it be possible to ES6 import common JS module with a loader hook? Mm. And that's actually doable. 
because you would there's a method in node named create require that enables you to create a custom require function yeah. that you can use in ES6 modules to load uh, common JS modules. So you could definitely build a loader that that would do that. Actually, in my TypeScript example, to import a TypeScript transpiler, I had to do that because it's not exposed as an ES6 module. So I had to load it as a common JS module. Ah, yes. And that's yeah, if you want to create backward compatibility with common JS through a loader, you can. The, the the entropy of weird things that will be available with this API is, is limitless. And that, that's one of the things I love with the Node.js and JavaScript at large ecosystem is that it's just an uh, infinite state machine where you just <laughs> give a few rules. It's an AI. It's a collective AI. You give a few rules and the pool of developers around the world will hack around it until everything is hacked around. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, kind of as a, a, a closing question, um, what's one thing that you want developers to take away about loader hooks? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Oh, I, I'm really unprepared for that one. <laughs> um, I guess the thing is, um, Node.js can be turned into a universal runtime. And I could I could make a pun on saying it's the Graal of runtimes, uh, referencing Graal VM, which is an amazing product in development by Oracle, uh, which aims at running all languages over the JVM. And we have a chance of doing something similar in Node.js, because through a lot of hooks, you you can load anything, and when I mean anything, it's anything that Node.js can understand eventually, including loading Rust code and having it transpiled, compiled to WebAssembly on mm. the fly. So, or mem even C or C plus plus code, as long as it can run either in WebAssembly or in JavaScript, you can run that in V8. And as long as you can do that, you can do a loader hook to transparently get that into V8. So yeah, hack around and bring every language of the world to Node.js so we can finally achieve world domination as it was the plan all along. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Vlad, Thanks so for, much for, for talking to me. us. Yeah, thank you. All right. How's everyone feeling? Good. We, I'm very excited for our next, uh, our next guest to come on, and that is Marianne Villa. Would you please come up to the stage? Let's have a round of applause for her. I think it's on. It's on? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Marion. Thank you. So uh, tell us a little bit about your talk. And the, the title of that talk was Transforming a Country Through Code. So yeah. Today we are sharing about our work in Pioneras Dep. Pioneras Dep is a nonprofit organization, an NGO from Colombia. And in in my talk, I I was talking about, I was sharing about when you think about Colombia, South America. First, you you don't know how to pronounce it if you are from <laughs> out of Colombia. So it's Colombia, not Colombia, yeah. as the university is very different. I, I admit that I was taking notes and I totally spelled it wrong, and then you corrected me, so I, I appreciate Sorry. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's is different. So, and the other thing is, uh, I know we have a really strong story about war and about the internal guerrilla problem, and I know you saw Narcos, of course, and Netflix is a pretty prime time show, but that's not the real in our country. So we create a, a, a small group with five girls in 2015. And we start from them. And right now we are circa 1,200 women, young women who are learning how wow. to code. That's, that's just crazy, the, the growth on that. Um, so um, that, that's great. Can you tell us what, uh, what Pioneer, uh, is it Pioneer? Am I saying that right? Uh, yeah. Pioneeris Dev, uh, can you tell us what that looks like? Like what uh, what you do uh, with that, and and what what is like the typical story of a young woman who goes through that program? Uh, what does it look like? Okay, so we realized that uh, it becomes like a study group of five enthusiastic girls. I was one of them, but then we realized that the eighty-five percent of our group that starts small. 
was from they have lower income, so they don't can afford to take a ticket to go to our innovation hub, Rutane in Medellin. So the first uh, successful story was my lady. My lady is a typical girl from the Comunas. Comunas is the poorest area of our city. And she can't afford to go to university or to get a job because she doesn't know how to 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 work in 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 a qualified work, no, on the street. So she goes to Pioneras and we only create a meetup, but this meetup really changed uh, her life. So it was like 10 uh, meetups that year. It was like 2016. And at the end of the year, she could get her first job in tech field. So it was awesome. That's so awesome. Um, what kind of technology does uh, the group focus on? So our our core was Node because we have a really cool mentors that are here in in this conference and they are really great from the from the tech culture in Colombia because they create the first conference in our country that was JSConf. I was co organizer in 2018 and 2017 and I'm very close to this community and actually they most of them. Uh, I know Note is 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 a backend, but most of them has really strong uh, roots from in the JavaScript language, and most of them are front end developers. But we have really cool girls and really smart girls doing Note in Colombia. Very cool. So uh, that that's like the way that you get into the program. Uh, you you kind of start off with no no skills in programming zero, at all. Zero, zero. They 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 actually. Mm, um, most of them don't have a computer, so yeah. we we have a special room in Ruta N with a really cool <laughs> a PC laptops, and they get in touch with the technology through this uh, space because they don't have it in their homes. Mm -hmm. So that's from zero, actually. And this is, um, and so they they go from that, and uh, how about how long does it uh, is a, is the typical program? It's one year, but I, I actually is, is specified that, I mean, they they learn how to how to search, how to search and how to search in Stack Overflow and and GitHub and and yes and how to um, they self learn in their in their in other space like libraries or a small study groups and they can share a, one laptop per five five young women mm -hmm. but with mentorship because we also have a mentorship program uh, through a year they can get the job very cool um, so this was started uh, in 2015 you said uh, in uh, your city, right? And that's Medellin. Medellin, yep. Uh, and it has expanded beyond that, right? Yes, right now we are in three main cities in Colombia, Cali, Barranquilla, and Medellin. Medellin, actually, uh, right now is a really big, we have a really big uh, tech hub right there. But in other cities, that's no story because they don't have too many companies in there. Or, or actually, it's not it's not trendy for for companies to be there, or don't have the spaces to 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 run the meetups. So we are really helping through Medellin to reach other areas from Colombia that they don't have too many opportunities. And what kind of support do you get, um, like from the uh, local businesses, or from the city, or from the the country? Like, uh, what kind of support is there for you? Actually, the three things we need. We need someone to want to share their knowledge. Mm -hmm. So you, if you are, uh, if you feel like you can share with us, Pioneras, you can write us or follow us in our social media and you are able to, to share with one Pionera in, made in Colombia or in other three cities that we are right now. Uh, the other thing is venue because we need a place to run these meetups and the co-working so innovation hubs will be very open to us in in uh, cities like Cali or, or another ones that we like to to open is Cartagena for example and Cartagena was really difficult to find a place but perhaps through universities we can reach them for 2020. And the third thing will be uh, food because we like to share with them some snacks, but will be a really low um, um, 
uh, we need a really uh, we need cookies and coffee. That's it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what? How does? Um, is there any other like type of funding that that happens for that? Yeah, we create um, we create a Shopify like um, um, we put these t-shirts that cost like. Fifteen dollars. Mm -hmm. It's in pesos that people see that and it's like thirty-five k, and they say like, "Oh my god, it's so much!" But it's it, the the TRM, the the conversion will be fifteen dollars. Uh, it could be less, but you can buy a T-shirt, and perhaps we could send it out of Colombia right now. But you are supporting our cause. And has has the group um, has it expanded outside of Colombia? Yes, actually, uh, I know in Latin America there are a uh, uh, few groups about girls in coding areas, but there are some places like Bolivia or Peru. Uh, Peru also have, but well, I mean Bolivia, Ecuador, and they have uh, a space for something like Pioneras, but we are uh, creating a change one community at a time. Mm -hmm. So open a meetup in other cities because we have a... a Third two uh, departamentos and departamentos will be like bureaus or something like that in demographical political divisions, but we have a really a jungle or really poor areas that they don't have developed like the big cities that we are right now. So we like to expand to the rural areas and perhaps create a bigger impact in our country mm -hmm. first. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's so cool, and it's such a, a great thing. And you, you truly are tr uh, transforming a country, just as your your title uh, states, uh, which is really cool. Um, how can how can we help with that? No, just only write us an email and give us ideas how you could support us, and I'm sure we can figure it out. Yeah, and uh, is that through like like um, helping with like teaching and and things like that? Yeah. We need we need people to share knowledge, and right now I know you are. We always know something uh, to share, but perhaps you are always apprentice in life. Mm. But this group really need knowledge and time. Time is the most value currency that you already have. So if you have the time to share one hour with these women, young women in Colombia, will be great. Perhaps we need to improve our English skills because they are really smart, but they need to 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 pass the barrier of the language and we need to, to practice our skills. So perhaps we'll be tech English skills, I don't know. Very good. And uh, was there anything um, that you, you didn't mention in your talk that you want to, to get out to everyone? What do you mean? <laughs> well, you, like, uh, I, I don't know, any kind of message or, or anything? I mean, your, your talk was really great. I was just asking. <laughs> No, I I think um, the, yeah the message that I I like to to share with you with all of you is please um, help us help us to transform our country uh, help us with your time and with your knowledge because I know here will be the brightest mind to to share about Node and about JavaScript world so we need them we need change these women young women world lives thank you. Love it. Love what you're doing. Thank you so much Thanks for doing so much. that. And thank you for talking with us. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, Chris Wil Wilcox and uh, Jason Ekovich. So please welcome them to the stage. All right, welcome. So, uh, Chris, you are uh, an engineer at Google, and your talk yesterday was, um, oh no, the robots are taking over, I think? Yeah, uh, so I gave a talk about uh, how we use bots and automation uh, for the Google Cloud client libraries uh, to try to make our job a little bit easier and a little less uh, repo garden-y. Yeah, absolutely. And um, in your talk, you, you mentioned using uh, ProBot. And so, Jason, you're the maintainer of ProBot. Um, Welcome, welcome to the, the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so 
uh, one thing that I thought was pretty cool in your talk uh, was you gave a, an example of, or you, you gave a list of the five levels of automation. And I just wanted to go over those real quick and then talk about them. Uh, and they were um, automating portions of your workflow is step one. Uh, automating the discovery and work, uh, but under supervision would be step two. Uh, letting the robot do the work for you, but with supervision would be step three. Uh, and then um, supervise, doing the work uh, supervising, unsupervised, uh, and pulling out the fallback support would be step four, and then the robot is your boss is step five. And uh, so you mentioned that we probably will never get to step five, and we wouldn't want to, which is, is probably a good thing. Yeah, um, it's probably not that surprising as some of the works in technology, but I watched some science fiction, and uh, <laughs> generally that goes poorly, right? Um, anyone that's seen HAL knows that when we take technology to that point, it, it gets mean-spirited, and causes us more pain than, than, than good. Yeah, for sure. What could possibly go wrong? Um, so tell us about a problem uh, that you're using robots to solve. So we use, uh, we use robots for uh, a lot of different things on Google Cloud. Uh, the example I used in the talk uh, was about being able to run CI for things that are uh, initiated by non-contributors. So uh, many people in the community uh, use dependency monitors, so things like Renovate. And those aren't uh, first-class members uh, of a repository. They don't have write access. But we don't really want to have developers having to screen repositories. And for, for most developers, this probably isn't a huge problem. But at Google, we have hundreds of repositories. And so having to go over each and every one uh, just to initiate CI to build and test the dependency update is, is very painful. And so we can save uh, literally hundreds of hours of uh, developer time by using bots to do that work. Uh, and we do it, uh, bots also for release management, publishing, uh, docs monitoring, uh, and we even take it not quite to step five, uh, but we have some robots that do uh, bot monitoring. So uh, for instance, our publishing flow to NPM is multi-step. The first step is that we build CI and we tag things on the GitHub side, but there's a step after that that will publish to NPM. And if for some reason in between those two, it, it doesn't get all the way to the end, a bot comes through, it notices, and it opens a bug for us. Um, that sort of ties back into the talk. It's good to scope your bots. So while it's monitoring, it is a very simple task. The worst thing it can do is open bugs against a repo. Uh, we have some safeguards so it doesn't try to open a lot of bugs. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, what could go wrong? So you have bots watching the bots? Yeah, and uh, the, the, last, the last bot in the chain is never really monitored, uh, <laughs> which is sort of problematic. Uh, but uh, knock, on, knock on wood, nothing terrible has happened yet. So. So uh, these bots that, that you're building to watch and, and uh, tag issues and, and such, uh, you're using Probot for that. Uh, so Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about Probot? Sure, I can do that. Um, before I do, though, I have this really funny story uh, yeah. that I want to share about bots watching bots. Uh, there was this tweet thread, and there was this tweet um, where an open source project uh, had a pull request that was uh, CI was run by a bot. It was then approved by a different bot. It was then deployed by a different bot. And then a different bot came along and said, hey, congratulations, everybody. Great job. Um, <laughs> so you know, who watches the bots except when they're kind of doing their own thing? It's kind of dangerous. That's awesome. Um, yeah. It was this <laughs> sort of weird thing where bots were interacting with each other. Yeah. yeah. It was awesome <laughs> uh, and terrifying. Um, so ProBot is uh, the sort of tagline on the website is, it's a framework for building GitHub apps. So GitHub apps are a way to integrate with GitHub. Um, Probot is very webhook focused. So you know something happens on GitHub, uh, your Probot app will be set up to receive a webhook. And then it has all kinds of like helper APIs to say, OK, this happened on GitHub. Now here's how we're going to handle it. Um, so a you know, very common example would be somebody pushes code. We want to run CI. Most CI providers will sort of have that built in, but mm -hmm. if you wanted to build that through ProBot, that's how you would sort of frame it. Nice. So that sounds uh, very similar to how actions work, from my understanding. Like they, they're responding to actions on a repository that yeah. might be essentially hooks. Yeah, hooks. totally. Yeah, so ProBot does predate actions. Yep. And so when actions was coming along, um, <clears throat> the other ProBot maintainers and I, we sort of looked at it and said, wow, this is. It's awesome. You know, this is great. This covers so many pain points that ProBot has. So like deploying your, so, you know, ProBot is just a framework. It's mm -hmm. a Node.js framework. Under the hood, it's running an Express server. So where do you deploy that? But with GitHub Actions, all of a sudden, 
GitHub runs your workflow automation tools, which is really exciting. Nice. That's really cool. So yeah, it's um, th that was one takeaway that I took from from your talk is is that Probot really or the the apps that you create, the bots that you create, are really just Node apps, uh, and then you can put them under version control and and keep them there. Uh, it sounds like you could do pretty much the same thing um, with GitHub Actions, where they're just under version control in your repository itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are definitely a few things that, like, if I were to build a workflow automation tool, mm -hmm. sometimes I'll use GitHub Actions, sometimes I'll use Probot. Um, I'd say that, you know, for things like persistence or long-running tasks, um, if, you know, you care if the server suddenly dies, yeah. uh, Probot's probably a better option. But if you think to yourself, hey, I'm going to run this app in, like, a Lambda function, um, Actions might be a really, really great place to do that. Nice. So, um, uh, tell me, like, are there things that, that um, actions solve that Probot doesn't, or vice versa? Yeah, so one of the uh, sort of, I, I have two things that I want to mention. So, um, I think the most exciting one to me is in GitHub Actions, you can uh, really, really easily clone down the repository that uh, the action is, you know, taking actions against. So, you know, you'll push some code and you want to run, like, some kind of test coverage tool or something. Um, in Probot, you'd have to, like, download a whole Git, you know, object thing, um, which in Node isn't very fun to do. But in Actions, you can, you know, add one line to a YAML file and suddenly you have all that code available to you. So that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of enables a whole slew of new things. Um, and then another one, and this is something that uh, in the Probot community we saw as being like a really important addition that we wanted to see in the platform itself, uh, is some concept of secrets. So, um, you know, in a repository you want to configure some API tokens to deal with other things, like maybe you're pushing to SendGrid or some other service, right? Um, there's not really a built-in way to do that in a repository, but with Actions you can include these things called secrets. Uh, and you can include those in your action runs, and it sort of just works super well. Nice. That's really cool. So there's there's a lot of a lot that you can do with that with either Probot or Actions. Um, Chris, what is the most complex thing that you have a bot doing? So typically, uh, you don't want bots to be complex. Yeah. Uh, so uh, complex bots fail in complex ways, and and that that tends to get sort of hairy. Um, I would say the, the neatest thing we probably do, though, um, not that it's that complex, uh, we find that, especially with so many repositories, uh, issues go stale. Um, either it gets assigned to a developer, and that developer gets overburdened or, or goes on leave, um, or it's just not their area of expertise. They were misassigned. Um, so it just falls to the bottom of their, of their stack and the stuff they do. And if we detect that, we'll, we'll pick someone else on the team to randomly assign it to. Uh, it's a, an issue juggler, essentially. Uh, and that, that tends to stop things from just getting stale and makes it, makes it look like we're a little more active and, and we can be a little more responsive to customers. Nice. Uh, the actually most complex thing we do is probably publishing, just because there's a lot of steps. Sure. Um, individually, it's all very simple, but we have to publish docs and, and as well as the, the, samples itself, uh, the samples for the, the, reposit or the repository in the package, uh, the NPM package. Uh, we use TypeScript, so that needs to be transpiled. Mm. Uh, none of it's too complicated, but um, all the pieces do need to fall together. And for that example, what level of automation would you say that falls under? At this point, uh, it's up to, uh, I, I would say it's three or four. So the, the levels are a bit fluid, mm -hmm. um, if you notice from the talk. Um, they're based on, on something to do in automotive engineering to sort of uh, do driverless car leveling and understanding. Um, so it's just really a way to frame um, sort of risk and reward, yeah. uh, honestly, more than anything else. Uh, but it's, it's about a level, probably a three, maybe a four at this point. The the thing that, that made the change for us is we, we go as far now to auto-detect if we auto-publish. And so as commits come into the main branch, uh, we can detect that there are, are new changes. And we use uh, a thing called conventional commits. So at the front of every commit is a label, um, be that chore, fix, uh, breaking, that allows us to detect is it a patch, a minor, a major release. Mm. We can auto-generate change logs. Uh, and from that, uh, really the only thing you do as a developer on the team at this point is merge the PR. Nice. And everything else is done for you. So we still control whether or not we, we publish NPM, sure. but the rest is, is fully automated. Nice. So that must save a lot of time. It's really nice. Uh, I don't want to go back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so going back uh, to that example that shuffles commits, or sorry, shuffles issues that are getting stale, um, 
I haven't looked at, at the APIs closely, but like, is there an action for that, or or oh, oh, sorry, a webhook for that, or like, are you doing it like, is it proactively searching for that and running like on a cron job or something? How is that being um, being kicked off? So we have uh, we have cron uh, bots. So yeah, that that's how this is done, and that's something we extended ourselves with using uh, okay. a thing called Cloud Scheduler uh, that Google Cloud can provide us. So we kick off that action, um, but already. Uh, Probot uses a thing called OctaKit uh, that gives you access to a, a ton of different GitHub uh, events. Um, and there's far more than I would have originally thought. Um, it's definitely something worth checking out. Um, but you can trigger on all sorts of things. And it's um, very fine-grained, down to pull request open, to synchronization, comments, labels. Wow. And so you can get, you can get pretty, um, pretty exact to when you want to take um, some sort of action and, and run some script. Yeah, very cool. So um, what does the future look like for you? Would you uh, still continue to use Probot? Would you use Actions? Would you have a mix? So uh, we started doing this before Actions was around, um, which is why we, we made the choices we did. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have a chance to evaluate Actions. I think if we started today, we, we would definitely consider Actions. But there are, there are a few uh, constraints. So uh, Actions don't deal very well with long-running tasks. Mm -hmm. So that can be problematic. You also. Uh, it's also hard if we ever wanted to scale up. So we used, uh, we used a thing called uh, Google Cloud Functions, uh, which ultimately takes a small bit of uh, Node.js or uh, a few other languages, but in our case it's Node, and, and executes it for us on an event hook. It, it starts up a service when we need it and shuts it down, so it, it costs us very little money. Mm -hmm. uh, and we could adapt that into Docker containers, fairly straightforward-like, and then uh, you know, maybe eventually we need a Kubernetes cluster, who knows. Um, we've also extended to have um, some security measures. So we, we store none of the secrets in the functions themselves. They're all stored in the key management service, um, also a thing that Google Cloud provides, and allows us to, to be a little more secure and a little more confident. It's also a lot easier for us to rotate our secrets. Mm -hmm. And so for, for a convenience standpoint, it's, it's pretty good for us. Nice. So Jason, what, is, um, what does the future of Probot look like? Uh, will it have some kind of maybe integration with Actions or, or some way of sharing like the capabilities between the two? Um, how, how does that look? That's a great question. Um, first of all, who knows? Um, yeah. We can sort of you know do our best guess. But um, what I'd love to see is some of the features of Actions um, sort of opened up to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So like the secrets thing I was talking about, yep. that's specific to Actions. But I'd love to see it come to you know the general ecosystem so the ProBot can uh, use it and you know enable it for uh, integrators that way. Yeah, that'd solve a big problem. Yeah, for sure. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I still see them as separate. Mm -hmm. um, I still see them as, you know, two separate ways to build integrations. Um, I personally have written, you know, a ton of GitHub actions. I think they're wonderful. I've written a ton of robot apps. And, you know, every time I go and build something new, I'm like, which one am I going to choose today? You know? Um, there are some ways to use a ProBot app within Actions. Uh, there's a, a repository in the ProBot org on GitHub, github.com slash ProBot. Um, it's called, I want to say, Actions Adapter. Uh, and the you know, premise is you wrap your ProBot app in this like little node adapter thing. You run it in Actions. Um, so it, you can kind of have the best of both worlds. I mean, like I said, ProBot's just node. So you can yep. you know, make some adjustments and throw it into a GitHub action and call it a day. So, yeah. And yeah. it really gives you that flexibility to really choose anything, whereas GitHub Actions are more kind of streamlined for GitHub. They're running on GitHub servers. This, like, you're running yours on Google Cloud Functions, so you can, you can have way more flexibility and um, make those, those more fine-grained decisions uh, with Probot. Yeah, I mean, I'd liken it to, you know, running your own server right. versus, like, throwing something on Heroku or, you know, it's just about control. Yeah. Very cool. Um, another cool thing that you, you showed off in your talk um, was a, a way to proxy uh, the webhooks uh, locally so that you can access those and test your probot locally. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? So I can talk about it. Or uh, I, think, I think Jason is a, kind of an expert on SME.io. I, I actually kind of want to hear you talk about it because I'm curious. <laughs> I never get to hear people like, you know, describe it to me. Sure. Uh, so. SME.io is a service that Jason's also pretty involved in uh, that proxies, in our case, JSON payloads from GitHub to a local host. 
And so it's, it's a rather simple service. Uh, Jason was telling me, I think it's uh, 100, hundreds of lines of code. It's at that level. And what it, what it allows us to do is locally test our bots. So we don't need to get uh, Google Cloud involved at all. We don't need to get actions involved or anything. We can run the Express server locally. We can uh, make a test repository on GitHub. And that will send the event to SME.io and they give you a slug. So it ends up being a random character string. And that will forward to localhost 3000 and allow us to, to test it locally. Uh, you can debug things then that way. Um, you can play around a bit. Uh, it doesn't have to be too serious then. It lets you experiment. Uh, the other really nice thing that SMEIO does is it lets you see the requests that have been made, uh, which I, I find very useful when it comes time to write uh, integration tests, unit tests. I can look at a real JSON payload, and I can capture that, and I can use it again mm -hmm. later. Um, that, that, I think, uh, is something I don't see a lot of examples of, but it's probably, for me personally, the most useful thing about SME. Yeah, that's a, a nice way to get at that is, is very beneficial. Yeah, I think we actually have a, an issue open in the web, like the, the server repo, that's like add screenshots of the JSON payload view, because it's super, super helpful. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, well, is there uh, anything else that you want to tell us about Probot um, that, that uh, we haven't heard about today? Um, I'd actually like to expand on uh, how SME works on the inside because sure. there's like this sort of really interesting API that I, I'd never heard about before. Uh, it's called the Event Source API. Event Source API. Yeah, and it's kind of like a, uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but it's like a unidirectional uh, WebSocket implementation kind of. Okay. Um, and SME works by having this one server that's constantly running um, and then multiple clients connect to it as... I want to say event source clients is the right term. Um, but it's sort of this, like, we have this, I don't know, uh, primary SME server that then shares payloads as they come in to all the different clients listening. So, you know, we built it specifically for Probot apps um, to, like, receive webhook payloads locally. But, you know, I've played around with, like, really weird implementations of it, you know, using it to capture uh, payloads from you know, all over the place to not just a Probot app, but, you know, some running server or something. So, yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing that we've seen people use um, for completely different, you know, intentions than we ever thought about. Yeah. And it's kind of cool seeing it. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so that is, that's, a, like, you said there's a single server. That's a server that you're running, and then the clients would be, like, like a server that, that Chris is running for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's like two separate parts to it. There's yep. SME.io, and then there's the SME client. There's a CLI, or you can use it programmatically. So like there's some built-in support in Probot. Okay. Um, but you can also just use the CLI directly. Cool. Very cool. Um, well, thank you so much for, for coming on and talking about Probot and for sharing your wisdom on, on robots and um, making me feel a little, a little safer that we're not gonna get to level five automation anytime soon uh, and that you're actively not doing that. So appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank thank you. you. All right, uh, we have one more talk that we're gonna do and that is uh, on Node.js worker threads. So I'd like to uh, introduce Rich Trot and Anna Henningsen, uh, if you'd please come up. And let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I was gonna have some. <laughs> I was gonna have some stadium walkout music, but. I was gonna have some stadium walkout music, but. You know. <laughs> So welcome. Um, why don't you introduce yourselves? Uh, mm. yeah. Okay, uh, so I'm Anna. I work for Neoform, which is an Irish Node.js consulting company, and I work on Node.js. So my job is uh, working on bleeding edge features for Node.js and other Node.js things. Nice. Yeah. So workers is one thing that I uh, pushed quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And workers. Uh, so I I'm learning about the node like team internals and does uh, what working group does workers kind of fall under or does it I mean, so it doesn't have its own working group it is um, it is what the, like we call a strategic initiative okay 
and uh, Rich can probably talk a lot more about what that exactly is than I do. But um, basically, so there's somebody on the technical steering committee of Node.js who is in charge of like pushing that forward. Thanks. Nice. Like who re who reports like what progress has been made and, and so on. Yeah. Cool. And uh, Rich, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Rich. I work at the UCSF University of California in San Francisco uh, library, where my Node.js work is tolerated, but is not <laughs> not my primary responsibility. Um, yeah, so yeah, mo mo uh, most of the work that happens inside Node.js, um, well, I don't know, depends how you quantify it, but uh, a lot of the work that happens isn't in a strategic initiative and isn't in a working group. It's, you know, there's no roadmap because the features that get implemented and the bugs that get fixed or whatever the people who are contributing and collaborating want to, you know, take their time to fix and, and, and implement. and. Uh, on a um, uh, really, really wanted worker threads. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So l let's take a step back, actually, for a moment. And what even are worker threads? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> well, they are threads built on the worker model that is used in browsers. OK. Like, yep. for a long, long time, browsers had this worker um, Like a service class. worker. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, web, web workers. Yeah. Oh, sorry, web yeah, workers. That's yeah, right. not service workers. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, service workers are also a thing. But like, yeah. like, like a while ago, somebody came up to me and asked me, like, like how do workers and service workers relate to each other? And, like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, like, completely different. Right. <laughs> um, it's like Java and JavaScript. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I totally had my terminology mixed up. I met web workers. <laughs> no, yeah, so web workers are way for for like websites to offload CPU intensive work to a different thread, communicate with it, like send JavaScript data back and forth. And, um, and yeah, worker threads essentially brings that to Node.js. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can like spawn multiple threads, like they're kind of like separate Node.js processes, mm -hmm. except they are like in the same process. And they can share data very efficiently, especially if it's like typed array data that is, you know, structured very, easily uh, serializable, mm -hmm. and so, yeah. It's yeah, I don't, I don't know if you saw my talk yesterday, but I totally evaded the, the subject of explaining <laughs> what they were yeah. by saying, they're kind of like web workers, but they have some differences, and I yeah. list, I point out one difference, I think. And then they're kind of like threads in other programming languages, but not really, and, you know, and yeah. then I just quickly moved on <laughs> rather than actually try to clarify what kind of gray area they actually fall into. Just yeah. go look at the documentation and start using them. Don't worry about it. Right. Don't worry about it. That's <laughs> Don't worry actually about it. good advice. Yeah. I love it. it Work threads. Don't worry about it. Just, <laughs> just, use, just, it. just use the thing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, not to, to get into semantics much uh, about it, because I, I will get all of this wrong. But like, when I, when I think about like, you have your, your main thread in like a, a JavaScript app or a Node app. Uh, and then like every time you do something asynchronous, that's kind of is that considered like a thread or a process? So that will offload. That could offload to a thread in the in the uh, 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 in in the pool that 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 node maintains under the hood. Mm -hmm. But no, it's not going to be a separate. Yeah. Right. Like it's not going to be a thread that you manage through like, this. Like definitely not in a way that should be visible through the API. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. you shouldn't think of it as a separate thread unless yeah. like. You know. Yeah. Um, you should think of it more in terms of like the event loop, right? Like, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. So um, I know that like web workers have some constraints in like they, for example, can't access the DOM or things like that. Are there similar constraints? Uh, obviously not to the DOM, but are there are there constraints to worker threads? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, like for the most part, no. For the most part, most Node.js um, Libraries are available in built-in modules. Like you can use require, and it will work the same way as it does on the main thread. Okay. There are some restrictions that are around, like managing per process state. Like for example, you can change the process title or change the current working directory. Because you know we were thinking like, okay, this is something that you know it affects the entire process. Right. right. And so like that should ideally only happen on the main thread. You know. Um, but generally, no. There's like no restrictions on what workers can do, and that's one of the like very important ways in which they are different from from web workers. Mm 
Yeah, there's, there's like one or two things, you know, or whatever, small number of things in process dot or OS dot, I think, that they yeah. can't access. Yeah. But for the most part, uh, yeah, you, if you can do it in the main thread, you can do it in the worker thread. Worker threads can spawn worker threads. They oh, can yeah. spawn additional worker threads. <laughs> yeah. It can just be worker threads all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what state are worker threads at right now? Like, are they something that, that I can use in production today? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so, so in Node 10, they are still considered experimental. Okay. In Node 12, they are stable. I, like, there haven't been any, like, significant changes to the API over the last half a year, maybe a year or so. So they have effectively been stable for a while. Like, the only few adjustments that we did before making it officially stable are some very weird edge cases around timing and the, like the message transfer thing that you know so in order to make it conform to the web platform test for that yeah. you you know you would never run into that as a regular <laughs> node developer <laughs> um, so yeah they've been stable for a while uh, in a way nice cool so i can use them as long as i'm in node 12 i can use them today um, yeah. I, I guess you could also use them on Node 10, but, you but know, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, a little, little warning. warning sign there. <laughs> yeah. um, in what, what can't you do with threads? And are there, like, with the up other, like, experimental features, are there things, like, I'm, I'm specifically thinking, you said you can require in there. I assume ES modules would also work within threads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what can't you do with them? Um... Well, well, I mean, like, one thing is, like, workers are not there to replace, like, the existing multi-process model that most, or, like, at least a lot of Node.js applications use. Mm -hmm. um, simply because, like, you know, um, it, it kind of makes things easier when you have different processes. Uh, in some ways, like, uh, you can attach debuggers to them individually mm -hmm. uh, with, with Node workers. That's, you know, it's kind of tricky. Um, it works, but it's tricky, and like Chrome DevTools doesn't have support for that yet. Um, and you know, you, if if like there's a hard crash for some reason, like the bug in Node or something, it won't tear the whole application down. Just the single process that like was spawned by the parent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they yeah, they aren't there to replace child processes. Gotcha. Mm. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's kind of. I mean. Um, yeah, every uh, like every use case is different, I guess. Yep. Um, uh, I was I I was um, I, I've been surprised a few times where uh, you know in most mostly making you know example applications to sort of demonstrate worker threats, uh, but um but I've been surprised a few times um, in both directions like oh this should really you know worker threads should have really performed a lot better here and they didn't or <laughs> the other way around where wow that really made that take no time at all um it's um yeah so i mean uh there uh you know the api for worker threads is pretty um small the surface area it's not um yeah. it's not a sprawling api it's not a complicated api it's the type of thing you can you can learn pretty quickly and and then i mean i just i find them just it's just a lot of fun to just experiment with so yeah. i mean i would I, I my 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 recommendation is go hog wild and just like see what <laughs> and just yeah. and just benchmark everything and see what happens and use them where they make sense and don't use them where they don't make sense um, i mean the one thing anna warns against in her blog post and 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 is absolutely true is um, that uh, you know if you you know you can uh, you're not going to um, you you you're not going to get any benefit for io heavy uh, stuff with uh, with worker threads because you know Node already does a lot in the with the asynchronous yep. calls and like you know, fs dot read or whatever um, to fs dot open and um, you know so like you know trying to like you know spawn worker threads to deal with you know massively concurrent I/O is probably not yep. gonna get you anything not gonna help at all right <laughs> so you know so that's that's something you can just not bother experimenting with unless you like seeing negative results which some of us do so yeah, yeah. um so what what um is, is there like a specific use case that that worker threads were created to to like be a, a solution for um yeah that is like uh cpu intensive work that um ideally requires a lot of communication between the, the different threads mm -hmm. because that is usually going to be faster than communicating with child processes. Mm -hmm. 
depending on how your data is structured. Uh, it's also a lot more flexible. Like you can send circular data or, or like generally things that don't fit into JSON over uh, over to threads. I think what Rich did in his talk is a very good example. Like for those who didn't uh, see it, uh, you want to explain or I mean. Like, um. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so if you might recall the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon game, um, it was kind of like that before before music, and so it was you know like uh, you have you know two musicians, and so you spawn two worker threads, and have one thread try to find everybody who played with that musician, and the other worker thread do it for the other musician, and sends it back to the main thread, and the main thread the main thread just you know uh, tells the worker threads to stop once. Once they've like once they have a musician in common, which basically means you have a connection, um, but until that happens, both worker threads are just you know running, 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 you know, gathering yeah. lists of people. Um, did that yeah. cover the part you wanted to cover? Yeah, okay. right. So like like <laughs> so, CPU intensive work right. that you know you want to offload from the main thread. Yeah, because those are like really ex those those queries get to be really expensive, at least yeah. the way I did them. Um, so for me, like the exciting use cases are that like you know you know. Um, so where I work, there's a lot of people who you know, do or are interested in doing data science stuff, and they all want to use Python, which is a great <laughs> language for that. Yeah. Um, JavaScript has been a terrible language for that. Uh, but you know, between th between worker threads and recently also getting big int, um, I you know like I mean we're we're not we're you know we're not we're not there yet, but it's getting you know it's getting pretty good for things like. Um, uh, to, you know, for machine learning and natural language processing and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think about for worker threads is um, all those JavaScript packages that do uh, graphic graphics manipulation. You know, like here, here's an NPM package that will you know, you know, create thumbnails for you or whatever. You know, I think I think of of graphics processing and you know that sort of thing is a CPU intensive thing. And you know, why not fire off? You know, four. You know, why not get a pool of four or eight worker threads, or how many processes, and, and how many, you know, make sense, and just you know, launch them and have them do all of them at once, and you know, bask in the glory of, of fi finishing your 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 job faster. Yeah. Yeah, like image image processing is a great example because you know, it's also CPU intensive work. Uh, like image data is usually represented in some way as like a U and eight array or you know array of bytes, and so like you can transfer or share them with zero cost with workers. And yeah. It's just like, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's something we haven't mentioned yet, which is that uh, you know un you know unlike with a cluster module where you have individual processes or or anything where you have individual processes, uh, workers you can you can you know share memory if it you know in certain situations like you know you know uh, if you know the data isn't a very if you know what size it is and if it's a very predictable format that you can uh, that you can put it in um, you can share the memory or you can even transfer the memory so that like you know I you know you know if you're the worker thread I give you the the uh, shared array buffer and I can't use it anymore but you can and then you know and so uh, which is really really cool. I nice. Think. Yeah, I was just going to ask if it was like shared array buffer, if that's what you're using as the medium to transport between. Yeah, share share. You know, like shared array buffers are shared by yep. default, <laughs> and and array buffers can be transferred. Like you can let Sorry, go of ownership of yeah. them. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, how can people get started with worker threads, or where would you point them to to get started with both using them uh, and or. Uh, contributing to that. Well, let me tell you, Nick. So if you, <laughs> if, you uh, if you go to, I don't know if this will still be true for like you know too much longer, but if you go to palacefamilysteakhouse.com, <laughs> there will be a list of links from my talk, and the very first link is a blog post that Anna wrote uh, using worker threads to uh, solve Sudoku puzzles. Nice. And uh, and then there's a bunch of other things in there about. Um, uh, uh, you know, my you know, couple of blog posts from me, and the documentation, and some sample code, and uh, a few other things. Um, as far as contributing to worker threads, my recommendation is know a lot about when. Uh, this is this is kind of a joke, but not really. Know a lot about Windows, and debugging Windows, and C plus plus, and then clone the Node repository, and fix test dash worker dash prof because that one has a real 
has been pretty stubborn. <laughs> that, yeah. Well, that was, <laughs> that's going to be quite a journey if you want to do it. <laughs> but we're here to help. Well, and by we, I mean Anna, because, you know. Yeah. I mean, she knows like, the implementation. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> so for, for like, you know, usually when you want to contribute, you want to like have some visible result of that. <laughs> and like having, like, like, I think the way that they are right now, workers as a feature are kind of complete. Mm -hmm. You know, we can add stuff and there's things that I want to work on, like um, startup performance or um, there's yeah. this like really cool thing that the JavaScript engine provides, which is called snapshotting. Mm. So like you can basically take a, a, a node instance and take a snapshot of that and then later deserialize it, which is kind of going to give you like a very fast startup if you like have boilerplate code that you run at the start of a thread or something like that. That would be really cool to have. It's going to be a ton of work. If somebody's interested, that's great. But yeah, you, you're going to have to read up a lot of um, V8 APIs with very poor documentation. <laughs> yeah. You ready? Yeah. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, but that, that sounds amazing. Thank you for the yeah. very specific uh, <laughs> bug to go with. <laughs> we know exactly where we struggle. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's been a terrible test for like forever. <laughs> well, cool. Anna, uh, Rich, thank you so much for, for chatting with me today about Worker Threads. And thank you to all of the guests that we had on uh, JS Party. Mm -hmm. um, definitely check out the podcast uh, at changelog.com slash JS Party. I think that QR code should work. I tested it, though, and it didn't. So, I mean, just because the screen's not bright enough. Uh, but, yeah, definitely changelog.com slash jsparty. Uh, go there, check it out, and we record every Thursday uh, at uh, noon central, 1 Eastern time. So, uh, check us out. Join the, the party. Thank you. Thank you so much.